half a pruta. So this is this one coin is four times the value of the little widow's mite. And the two palms here indicate the two pruta denomination. And this is just bronze. So Herod had an eight, a four, a two, a one, and a half pruta coins. He's one of the most prolific guys over his 30 six year reign or so, he had a lot of coins. And he had a really important coin that he had a hand in that I'll talk about later. Herod had a son named Herod Archelaus. And Archelaus also had some interesting coin types. And as he was an ethnarch, he wasn't actually a king, he was an ethnarch in the area, which is kind of the name of a significant leader in the region. And it actually says on some of these coins, ethnarch right there, and a little caduceus, the symbol of what we know in the medical industry today. Well, it turns out Herod is here because he is the son of Herod. Herod is gone by now. The Herod the Great is gone by now. But a very prominent symbol of the Jews in this region and time is the grapes. So again, no image of the king but an icon form that's indicative of the culture that is issuing the coin. On the other side is, believe it or not, that's a Macedonian helmet, a battle helmet. <clears throat> and those are cheek straps hanging down on the side. It took them a long time to figure out what the heck that was. Okay, I, I've seen 17th and 18th century references to this coin where they call it completely strange and different things. And, and finally, about the, uh, the late, eight, uh, late 19th century, they figured out that that was a Macedonian helmet. There's another Herod in the family. The Herod in the family here was Herod Agrippa. And this is Herod from the Acts of the Apostles. The reason I love this coin is I can use this with kids of all ages. And I can say, how would you know if this says Agrippa Basilier with something that looks like a pyramid with stuff on it and, and a globe on the top. Well, what, 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 how does that mean Herod, the king? You and your family, you're 13 years old, and you and your family are traveling to Jerusalem as you do every year on your vacation with all your cousins, your brothers, and your father's brother, and all the friends. You're traveling together because of the safety requirements. Maybe you're coming from Alexandria. Maybe you're coming from Damascus. Maybe you're coming from Antioch. But you're all going for the Passover festival to the great city of Jerusalem. If you were to see the great king of the Jews there, the day would be warm, the sun is shining. Would the king of the Jews be just walking down the street? Probably not. He'd probably be carried on some kind of a litter. Probably be carried by strong men. He wouldn't have to deign to walk with regular people. If the sun was shining, would it be beating down on his head? What would be covering his head? Please feel free to shout something out. A, what? a parasol or a canopy. Ah, okay, so now we're getting a little bit of a flavor for this thing. Would the canopy or the parasol over top of him would it be a plain, drab UNC or whatever, insert college here? I just, I paid, I paid for one of my kids to go to Chapel Hill. I swear Chapel Hill, just to go. I just, I'm going to go there, okay. Is it going to be that kind of a, or is it going to have, is it going to have jewels? Is it going to be the Surrey with the fringe on top? And will the fringe that's right here, Will it have jewels that sparkle and capture the light and attract attention to the great king being carried through the streets of Jerusalem? And now, when you hand that coin to the kid of all ages, they look at that and they say, oh yeah, that represents, that represents King Herod. I saw him in the street last year. That's the same guy. And on the back, we happen to have three ears of grain because these coins are struck by the Jewish leadership under the thumb of the Romans. The Jews through this period were basically enslaved by the Romans. They were there for two purposes. To grow food so that food could be sent back to the continent, back to the mothership, and they were there to pay taxes to make their, their miserable life even worse for the 
by the power under the power of the Romans. But here, L is a dating system of the year six. It happens to be that this particular coin was struck soon after the time of the crucifixion of Christ, but during the time of the Acts of the Apostles. So this, the ears of grain are simply an admission that the Jews are there to grow grain for the Romans. So here it is, another propaganda story on these coins. Let's get into some interesting ones here, too. In Mark 12, the Pharisees question Christ. They want to trap him. They come to him and say, shouldn't you and your followers be paying the Roman tribute tax? And Christ thinks, he says, oh boy, there is no good way out of this, out of this conversation. You know, if he admits that they should pay, then he's got he's to deal with that. If he admits they shouldn't pay, he's a rabble rouser. He's already a rabble rouser, but he could be in trouble. So he's in trouble with the Jews, or he's in trouble with the Romans. He's in trouble, no matter how he answers. But he says, show me the coin that I'm supposed to pay this tax with, whose image and inscription is on the coin. And it turns out, I, th I think I, yes, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. The image is that of Tiberius. That inscription is clearly indicating the Roman emperor. And do we remember back? This isn't just in Mark. It's also, I think, in Matthew. And it says, basically, render under God that which is God's. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. So, okay. This coin becomes what we call the tribute penny, because tribute, as in the payment to, of one day's pay, or one silver coin, to the Romans, and penny, because at the time, in 1611, uh, a rather famous book is published, King James version of the Bible, and at the time, one silver day's pay coin happened to have been called a penny. And so that 1,600 years later, transcription of words now sticks, and we call that a penny. Still one day's pay. You remember back when I was talking about the relative denomination and values and names? That stuck. And so we call that the tribute penny. On the back is a picture of his mom. Just what every mom wants to be, in effect, deified on a coin. And you know what? There's an interesting legend on here, too. Pontiff Maxim, literally from Latin, the great bridge builder. The word pontiff we see today in the Catholic tradition, okay, but it really means a bridge, physically a bridge, whether it's a bridge between man and God, whether in this case it is the guy who's responsible for keeping the uh, and the water systems and all that. So the great bridge builder was Tiberius. One of my favorite coins. Four days pay, a tetradram, much heavier. I'm actually gonna hand around two different ones of these. Sometimes ancient coins and modern coins are what we call slabbed or encased in plastic to protect them. I just, I just bought this coin. I don't know if I told my wife about this yet. Uh, I just <laughs> bought it. Was, it was only $2,000. So don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> this, is, this coin is uh, one of the most significant ones from one, one of the guys that had bought two of the major hordes of the shekels of Tyre, the 30 pieces of silver coin used to pay Judas, okay? And this is perhaps one of the finest known that has struck the year of the crucifixion of Christ because they're all dated. And we'll go into that a little bit. So I'm going to hand that one around. I just got it like two weekends ago, and I'm really happy with it. But I've also got one you can hold in your hands because I think it's just as important to feel the weight of the coin. I have a woman that buys coins from me. You know how she buys coins? She says, let me feel it. And she literally holds on to it and she rubs it and she feels the energy, which I, I perfectly believe that that's fair. 
and she loves certain coins. She'll pass up a dozen and she'll pick one up and say, oh, that's it. That was there. You know, it's, that's great. I think it's wonderful that she likes it that way. So let's talk about these coins. This is a, this is a really interesting coin type because this coin is in more places than just the story associated with the 30 pieces of silver in the payment to Judas. This coin is also the coin in the fish's mouth. So when Christ is again questioned as to whether or not he should be paying the appropriate temple tax, the temple tax was generally paid when these families made this migration during the Passover festival to, to Jerusalem, to the big city. They would go and they would pay every adult male in good standing in the Jewish faith would pay two days pay. Now, we talked about this being a tetradram or four times dram. And when you feel this coin, it is a big, substantial, heavy coin in silver. Happens to be that the city of Tyre, the Phoenician city of Tyre, there's the city emblem, the Club of Hercules. This is actually Melquart or Hercules. It turns out that this coin and the half denomination coin, the didram, the shekel and half shekel of the city of Tyre coinage were the only coins allowed to be used as temple tax payments by Jewish law. And the reason is, we talked before about that uniformity and fineness. It turns out that the Jewish leadership said, you know what, the only coins I want are these because the city of Tyre knows how to make their coins. 94 to 98% fineness in silver, uniform weight every single time. And boy, when those guys come in with a Roman silver from Alexandria, when they come in with a Syrian coinage from Damascus, when they come in with a Syrian or Roman coinage from, uh, from Antioch, the quality of the coins was terrible. So by law, that's the coin you had to use to make the payment. So, you come in from, Jerus from into Jerusalem, from these other cities, you have your own local coinage. Okay, you're going to go to the 7-Eleven? You're going to cash it in and make change? No. As you get to the Temple Mount, there are people there that take your coins, and they take the money, and they change it. They're called... Money changers. money changers. This is a quick crowd. All right. <laughs> a quick crowd. So the money changers are there to take the coinage from all these other cities and convert them into good quality silver. Now, I'm going to step out on a limb here and say, did those people do that kind of thing for free? No. No, they did not. No, they did not. In fact, it's well documented that not only would they first make the conversion to get the silver right, but then they would charge an additional 9 to 14 percent on top of that just for the pleasure of changing your money for you, okay? <laughs> and so the money changers were there, and as you remember, in that last week when Christ is in Jerusalem, he goes in and he turns over the table. Can you imagine all the carefully weighed out and balanced and all this stuff? Think about, the, think about what's going on to these people. When this table gets turned over, when the people, the regular folk that are there to see this remarkable act take place, this man is disrupting. That is, that is iconic action. And now that you know a little bit more about that story, I hope that that, that story has depth for you at a, at a different level. Let's take a look at what's going on here. These coins are actually all dated. If you reach in your pocket and you pull out a quarter or, or, or whatever coin you've got, there's a date on it. There's also typically a mark that tells you what city it was struck in. These coins are no different. In fact, on this particular one, let's, let's check the date. On this particular one, this was struck at the OK Corral, right there. <laughs> okay, well maybe not. Maybe not the OK Corral. This was struck. They didn't use the same kind of numbers we do. Okay. They happened to use Greek letters that represented numbers. And the Romans had this really obtuse way. I, 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 X, L, C, V. You know, they had all kinds of stuff in there. And it was a little bit difficult. The Greeks had it easy. 
alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. First five letters of the Greek alphabet. One, two, three, four, five. Iota, kappa, lambda, mu, nu. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Rho is 100, and so on. And basically all the numbers we need to know can be pretty carefully put together with about 11 Greek letters. Okay. Now they threw an extra one in there because they needed to. And I, I try not to use coins like that in the examples because it's a little bit tougher to talk about. But the point here is that iota kappa. Iota was 10, kappa is 20. Iota kappa, lambda mu nu, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. It turns out that theta is 9, so the year 20 plus 9. In the 29th year, in 1976, we had two dates on our coins. What was the other date? 1776, because it was an important date in our history, and we wanted to celebrate that and commemorate that date, right? Every time in the ancient world, they would date their coins based on either how long the ruler had been in place or from a very important date at the starting of their history. And it turns out that that's exactly how these coins are dated. These coins are dated the 29th year of the autonomy of the city of Tyre. It turns out that Tyre was allowed to strike their own coins starting in the year 127, 126 BC. So as a result, this coin is dated, as you see here, 98, 97 BC. Now I say two dates on it. If I said 97 BC, we'd be relating that to January 1st to December 31st. We don't know exactly what, because it was tied to a particular month or day or year within that. And what happens is, we just spread it across that. Somewhere in that time frame is, a, is the year that that coin was struck. And the coin, you know, I honestly even can't remember. Who has the, who has the shekel in their hands right now? Uh, the, the, the loose one. What is the date of that coin? Uh, and you can see it on the, uh, on the paper that's going along with it. It should be at the bottom of the page on that little paper, the little uh, two-inch square paper there, probably in your lap. See the date on that one? Just so I can get it in my head. I should. They change all the time because I, I have them and they're gone and they're out. Bottom of the page there? Let's take a look. Well, that sounds good. This is, um, this is from the year five. Christ would have been about 10 or 11 years old when that coin was struck. That's a lifetime shekel. This is not a lifetime shekel. So, Okay, so let's move. There are a lot of characters coming into play at this time. One of those characters is Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate also was aware of this Jewish tradition, not having graven images on the coins. So that same 13-year-old child that's in Jerusalem on vac vacation, how does he see, he or she see Pontius Pilate? Pontius Pilate, as the governor and the chief priest of the cult of Tiberius, if he was in public, he would have been at some kind of public spectacle. If you went out to a, a heavy metal rock band concert in the 70s, there would have been guys playing guitar up there, and they would have had pyrotechnics going. In fact, they probably do some of that stuff today. They would have had flaming things and light shows. They did that back at the time of Pontius Pilate, too, and the Romans. To become a spectacle in front of people was important. And so one of the things that they would do was that, and I'll get a little graphic, no one's had breakfast too recently, they'd slit open the belly of the animal and the entrails would flow out onto the table and Pontius Pilate would reach back for one of his pontifical instruments and he would wave his magic wand over those flowing entrails and he would say, ah, great Tiberius Caesar, you will have an excellent year. The crops will come in strong, the taxes will be collected plenty, and it's going to be good. And then he'd look at a flight of birds and he'd wave his magic wand and he'd say, there's a sign that says things will be great. So the visible symbol of the power of Pontius Pilate was this augur's wand, or litus, as it's called. One of the other years of the coins of Pontius Pilate has a long-handled ladle on it. And you could think how that might be used. 
Let's just say you had a basket filled with glowing coals. And if you were to take oil and pour it onto the hot coals, what might happen? Do you want to be using a short-handled ladle or a long-handled ladle for that event? The long-handled ladle is called a simulum, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have one of those coins here. I'll put one of those out too. There's a simulum on the back of the other coin of Pontius Pilate that I have. And it turns out that this coin is dated too. Tiberius Caesaros of Tiberius Caesar with the augur's wand. I wanna, I'm going to ask a question here. What was Pontius Pilate's wife's name? It was Claudia, but don't, don't, don't. And you can see that in scripture, by the way. But she actually played an important role. Go look that up sometime. Now, it turns out, we talk about this dating system. This symbol here is not a Greek letter. It looks like what we know as an L. But what it means, it's a symbol in the Greek dating system that says of the year or in the year of. So let's take a look. Here's Iota and Zeta. Iota was 10, Zeta is 7. In the 17th year of the reign of the Emperor Tiberius, that puts this to the year AD 30, which is the likely year of the crucifixion of Christ. About 80, 85% of the scholarship out there supports the year 30 as a likely year. Many, maybe another 10 or 15% support the year 33 as the likely year, but does it really make a difference? No. But this coin, knowing that this coin was struck in or before the year of the crucifixion of Christ, that coin was there in Jerusalem during the lifetime and short ministry of Christ. We move on to, uh, is this a symbol anybody's ever seen before? And by the way, you will have noticed, and I'm just going to take this one, you will have noticed in the handout that you're taking away with you today that I've got eight of these coins that we're discussing today here. And, and where there is a scripture verse that I can tie you to, I would challenge you to go back and look up these, these verses and to create another living context to what you, what you had in your hands today. And then leave this out on your table when your friends or family come by. Share it with them too. Show them how this kind of simple Bible study is interesting, maybe even uh, elegant. So this symbol, I'm sure you guys have seen before, right? I'm sure you have. This is the monogram of Christ. And this is the, the he or chi x rho. That is basically the CHR of Christus, chi rho. Now, I do want to say that Magnentius, who was the guy that struck this coin, was the, was the inventor of A and W root beer. You see this right here, A and W, A and W root beer. Now, those of you that read lowercase Greek are saying, don't be silly. You know that I, I do tend to work a lot more with kids, so I'm sorry for some of these jokes, but you're, it's kids of all ages. A, alpha, W, no, lowercase omega. Jesus Christ, the beginning and the end, alpha, 